Hi, I'm Dave Howard, Executive Director of Louisville Folk School. As a description for the visually impaired, I'm a white man in my 40s with a beard, wearing a denim shirt, and a music studio filled with folk instruments. I'd like to thank Kentucky Performing Arts for their partnership. On behalf of Louisville Folk School and Kentucky Performing Arts, welcome to our conversation series, exploring the African-American influence on Kentucky music. This program would not be possible without your support and the support of the Kentucky Tourism Arts and Heritage Cabinet, South Arts, the IBMA Foundation's Arnold Schultz Fund, Kentucky Humanities, the Awesome Foundation, Brown Foreman, Tilford Dobbins and Schmidt, the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. As we explore the stories of African Americans who've had a significant influence on the folk music traditions of this land that we now know as Kentucky, we'd also like to acknowledge the indigenous peoples of this land. We honor the Chickasaw, Shawnee, Cherokee, and Osage peoples who've lived here for over 10,000 years and remain here today. I'd also like to invite you to participate in this conversation during the question and answer portion you can use the comment feature below. Thank you, enjoy the program. My name is Michael L. Jones. I'm an African American male. I'm, I have glasses and I'm wearing a black and white shirt and gray slacks. I'm seated in a blue chair. Thank you for joining us today for the first of a three-part series titled Exploring the, the African-American Influence on Kentucky Music, presented in partnership by the Louisville Folk School and Kentucky Performing Arts. Today's conversation is focused on the life of Kentucky-born musician Henry Hart. We are streaming live today from O Forester's Paris Town Hall in Louisville, Kentucky. I'm joined today by musician and composer Rachel Grimes. Thank you. So glad to be here. Um, for our visually impaired friends and audience, um, I have newly short hair and I'm wearing a green flowery top and black slacks and I'm really glad to be here with my colleagues to talk about the incredible Henry Hart. Okay, also joining us is Dr. Clark Kimberling, a professor of mathematics at the University of Evansville. Thank you, Michael. It's very good to be here. I'm uh, very pleased to be invited from Indiana, about uh, a mile and a half north of here. So uh, for the benefit of those who are visually challenged, uh, I'm also sitting in a blue chair. I have a dark sports coat, and uh, I've been at the University of Evansville since 1970. All right, well, I wanted to start things off by um, asking each of you to tell me a little bit about how you got into uh, your research on Henry Hart. Sure. Um as, as in with a lot of things in Kentucky, it was kind of a windy path for me. I first learned about Henry um, when I was researching his grandmother, Dolly. And Dolly was one of two women on an expedition into Kentucky to, to settle it in um, 1775. So she was only one of two women in the Daniel Boone party that was coming up in to settle Fort Boonesboro in Kentucky. Um, at, she was enslaved to Richard Calloway, who is a distant family relative of mine, and I was actually researching Calloway's wife when I learned um, about the story of Dolly, and I was just immediately, I pivoted to, oh my gosh, I've never heard about Dolly, and wow, she was on this incredible uh, journey, no doubt worked very hard and what an incredibly um, important chapter in history to be a part of. So in researching her, I learned that she had a son in November of 1775, Frederick, uh, who later was Frederick Hart. Um, Frederick, uh, in his years in living in Frankfort, Kentucky, 
um, married a woman named Judith Brown who was enslaved at that time on an estate in Frankfurt and they have at least two children that I know about and one of them was named Henry so started researching Henry and I discovered oh my gosh he's a he's a musician he's a violinist and composer and published musician and um, I just couldn't put put it down I've been researching him on and off for years since then so <laughs> really excited to talk about him today Okay, Clark, how about you? How did you discover Henry Hart's music? Well, it got started because of my intense interest in what makes a good melody. This is a question that has occupied composers and writers throughout the ages. Nobody knows the answer. But I found myself immersed in a huge collection of sheet music from the 19th century that's uh, at the Library of Congress. and. I came across melodies by one Henry Hart, whom I'd never heard of, but I thought these are wonderful melodies for the type of music that they represented. And I asked a, a librarian at the University of Evansville Library, a reference librarian, to find out who Henry Hart was. And to my surprise, the next day, uh, I learned that Henry had lived in Evansville. He wrote a piece called The Evansville Favorite Waltz and uh, he had a family of daughters that uh, became quite well known in a Hart family orchestra. So that was my introduction. Okay, um, I know, um, Rachel, you've been working on uh, um, a documentary about uh, Henry's family and uh, you brought a clip for us that uh, we set this, this up for us before we actually see it. Sure. Um, so uh, fairly recently, I went with my friend Sharon Mitchell, who's a researcher at Berea College, and she and I have a, a lot in common in our genealogy and research interest of the early pioneer era um, folks. And so we met at Liberty Hall and Orlando Brown Estate to um, sort of recall where we are and then um, in this video, you'll see a little bit more about sort of the facts of Henry's life and also his parents. And, um, you know, it, it's a really compelling and amazing story, a, a very uniquely American story. Okay. So. And, and tell, who was Orlando Brown, you say? Orlando Brown and his brother Mason Brown lived on uh, the Liberty Hall and Orlando Brown estate. Um, their father... Uh, was an early settler and landowner in, in Frankfort, uh, Kentucky. So the houses are still there and you'll see them in this video. Um, I've been making uh, videos uh, related to The Way Forth, which is a folk opera I wrote a couple of years ago that includes a little snippet of Henry Hart's music. There's a song about Dolly. And um, we've been making film for several years now with my, with my colleague, Catherine Axley, who um, has filmed this recent piece. So we just polished this up this week for and this so event. Was Brown uh, Frederick's last owner, or was his connection? No, uh, we, it looks as though Frederick's last name was Hart, which oh, we yeah. think was adapted from Nathaniel Hart. Okay. But um, we think that possibly um, Mason Brown or Orlando Brown were the last owners of Frederick and definitely of Frederick's wife, Judith. Okay. And likely Henry, too. But uh, there's more to learn in the, in the clip here. Okay, well, we're going to watch the clip <laughs> yeah. now. So. Is it like right around there? Yeah, I would say. Uh, yeah, down in through here. So I guess this is the kitchen and the laundry in below. This says the Orlando Brown House was 1835. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay, 1796. Yeah. Okay. If Frederick was able to earn his freedom in the early to mid 30s, then he probably wasn't living on, on the site. So he was living somewhere nearby. It was probably over in that second street area down on the river. They called it the bottom, the crawl. That could be where Frederick lived. Yeah, I mean, because that free. was a very old black neighborhood. Yeah. So the bottom was probably the one on the river. Yeah, it's definitely on the river. Yeah. All of that back in there is a black neighborhood. On the edges of it were the hemp factories. Oh, wow. So, and that was a major... Which was a big deal then. Mm -hmm. Judith was still living here, probably, and there were houses way down this line 
where the slaves lived. And I'm okay. sure they were shack style cabins. It was probably one, probably you know, no one bigger room. than this, this structure here. Yeah. yeah. I guess smoke houses are brick. So Orlando was the enslaver of Judith, who was Frederick's wife. Okay. And he's one of the eight or ten men that was behind that 1842 census. It was like an 1842 oh. free man census, mm -hmm. and it was kind of like a review of every free person in Frankfurt, their job, how right, old they okay. were. I hadn't thought about it. I should have gone back and, and looked um, at that. Yeah. It proved Frederick was still living here in 1842, mm -hmm. but I think after that survey was done, everybody was pretty freaked out. I think people that didn't get a good review felt like they had to get out of town because the whole point of that was to say survey how well. was to, to intimidate. And so I guess it was not too long after that that he, they got the funds together to, to get Judith and Henry out of here. Mm -hmm. Now the one that we haven't talked about is that we need to look at are those hearts that are in Berea Cemetery. I know, I don't know how in the world will. See, I feel like they may be. All right, so um, Clark, as we saw in Rachel's video, Henry Hart was born in 1839 in Frankfurt, and he went to uh, Ohio, and he got his musical training. Um, do you know any much about uh, what his studies and how he ended up coming to uh, Evansville? Well, not a great deal is known. Probably the best source was uh, an article in a paper published in San Francisco called the Pacific Appeal. I think the year was 1879. And it tells that Henry received his uh, musical training, including learning to play the violin, uh, when he was in the region around Cleveland. I think he had moved there with his parents. And then uh, right about the time of the Civil War, he um, was employed on steam, a steamship that um, went from where he was in Ohio down to New Orleans, and he moved to New Orleans. That's where he played at um, a place with the name Prescott's Museum. He's uh, described as the first violinist. And that's where he met his wife-to-be, uh, Sarah. Uh, she's described as a professional musician. And so, and she's gets, from Jeffersonville originally. That's right. She's from Jeffersonville, Indiana. Yeah. Which probably helps explain why 
uh, the, the pair moved to Indiana. We're not sure why they chose Evansville. We're glad that they did, though. So he was pretty well an accomplished musician by that time. When, when it comes down to what training he got, that's something future researchers can look into. Did he have formal training? Did he have a formal violin teacher? Who knows? <laughs> Do you, do you have any ideas what attracted uh, Henry and Sarah to move back to the area, Rachel? Well, I had always wondered that. And um, last summer, I, I really dug back in, and that's when I learned about the Idlewild. So I bet you it's that the Idlewild was, the, was one of the boats he was working on. And the Idlewild was a what they called a U.S. mail packet boat. So it had a very short route. It went from Cairo, Illinois, to Paducah, to Evansville, and back every day. So it was delivering mail. So I bet you he chose Evansville, like you say, because his wife was from Indiana, and that was one end of the route. So he, you know, he could get to work and start and come back in a day, I believe. That's what the way those boats work. So that's my guess as to why he wound up there. And I've always wondered, you know, was he loading mail? What was he doing on that boat? Maybe he was a barber. There's an indication that he had a barber shop in Evansville. Um, he owned property there, and he had a barber shop. So it's hard to know what job he did on the boat and whether he played music on the boat. That's another thought, you know. But that's how I uh, guessed that he wound up in Evansville. Okay. And um, in Evansville, uh, Henry was very uh, productive. He published a lot of sheet music. And I was interested... Um, Clark, in the, you did a Wikipedia page and then supplements about Henry. And a lot of the sheet music, um, a, a lot of the songs were things that I had identified with uh, Sam Lucas, who is, uh, was one of the first black minstrels. Uh, uh, Good Sweet Ham, uh, of course, we've talked about and saw in the video. Uh, and but Sam Lucas's most famous song is uh, "Carve That Possum," and it uh, I've always seen words and music by uh, Sam Lucas. But you say Henry was involved in that uh, song too. Yes, that article I referred to uh, that was published in San Francisco. Um, it did have a, a lengthy article about that particular piece, "Carve That Possum." And as I understand it, Henry formed a group of traveling uh, minstrels in 1874 while he was in Evansville, and it included Sam Lucas and some of the other best-known people in that business of that time. They, they traveled to four states, and one of the songs that Sam song, uh, sang was uh, Carve That Possum, and he, uh, after the group disbanded, which was in the latter part of 1874, uh, Sam published it independently without giving Henry any credit for it. So according to this article, Henry was uh, upset about that and they exchanged letters and eventually, uh, I can't quite quote it, but um, I understand that Sam publicly acknowledged that Henry was the true author. And um, I think, uh, when was it, uh, in 1879, he, he moves to Indianapolis, and there was like a change in musical styles, because in Evansville and on the riverboats, he's, he's, it's more minstrel music that he's playing, but then... Um, he becomes like kind of like a society band leader. And Rachel, you were telling me early that he actually started publishing like classical pieces. Yes, um, you know, it makes me think he did get classical training early on because uh, the, the Idlewild Mazurka, I have to look it up. Uh, I believe it was published in, in 1871. Mm -hmm. So that's early and it was one of his earliest published pieces and it is a straight up Western European mazurka. It's, it's a piano solo. It has no hint of what I would call popular music or minstrelsy. You know, it's, it's really um, more traditional. And he dedicated it, this was a key piece of, uh, a key clue. He dedicated it to Captain Gus Fowler. And 
one day I, it just occurred to me, well, who is, wait, Captain? You know, maybe that's a riverboat. So that's how I found the Idlewild. You know, I connected these two, and I know there's other, you know, uh, references to him working on steamboats, but it seems like Henry was really interested in a lot of different styles. So I think he was already writing sort of more traditional classical than more popular kind of plantation song type, and then realized, wow, actually the, the, the money's in being a dance band, an entertainment band, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's Indianapolis was. I, I think it's important. A great to, place for uh, that. Notice from the titles of Henry's pieces that he played a lot of dance music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I know he did that in Evansville. I mentioned that Evansville favorite waltz Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the mazurka mm -hmm. uh, is a dance. And when he moved to Indianapolis, uh, his music really caught on. Yeah. We couldn't find any more publications of his music after he left Evansville, but he became really quite famous mm -hmm. in Indianapolis, both for um, his band that he led, and then as his daughters learned music, their... their uh, got to be a Hart family orchestra that was very well known, very well represented in the Indianapolis newspapers of the time. Yeah. So he had five daughters and each of them uh, was a, a noted musician? Is that? Well, I think there were seven or eight daughters okay. born and um, six reached adulthood and um, at least two of them had professional yeah. music careers, yeah. But they all played music and um, we think, you know, Clark and I have talked about this before with Sarah, their mother being a pianist and Henry playing, you know, uh, violin, viola, cornet, probably some, some piano. They, their parents taught them all these different instruments so that they could just sit in and, you know, if, if Hazel was already sitting at the piano or the harp. Well, the, the other one would go to the, you yeah. know, the harp, or she'd pick up, the, you know, a, a little drum. Or, so yeah, I think all the d daughters knew how to play with their parents or were taught by them. Okay, and the the two daughters that were most noted, mm -hmm. uh, there was Hazel, who was uh, a principal of a school that's now named after her, mm -hmm. and she started the Pioneer Jug Band, was yes. a, a kids group, and then there was Myrtle Hart who was um, played in orchestras and was a harpist. Yes. And, and Clark, were you telling me that uh, you thought that Henry was her first harp teacher? Like, how many instruments did this man play? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is mentioned that from time to time he would play viola, which is like a large violin, yeah. and astonishingly, a cornet which is a brass instrument, mm -hmm. I came across one reference to his being the leader of a brass band. This would have been about 1880, not long after he had moved to Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. uh, may I read a little bit about the daughters? Sure, sure. <laughs> this, is, this is from a 1901 article about Henry Hart and his family music um, from an Indianapolis newspaper. Mr. Hart alone is not all of Henry Hart's music. He has a family of interesting daughters. And as they grow up to young womanhood, and even when quite small, they take their part in the orchestra. First, there were Myrtle and her father with piano and violin. Recently, I came across an article in an Indianapolis paper that referred to um, a performance by Myrtle with some other people on the piano, piano, not harp, mm -hmm. piano, when she was 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So it mentions the harp is a fine instrument for dances, and it was decided that Myrtle must learn to play it. She did take lessons from uh, the solo harpist of what became the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Yes. Uh, it appears that it was about three years that she studied with Edmund Shooker, to go on with the article. Then Miss William, that's a boy's name, but the Hart family had only girls, no boys, and they wanted William to be a boy, so they named her William. <laughs> uh, in census records, she's Willie, and I've also seen articles in which she's Willa. Mm -hmm. She learned to play the piano and cello. cello yeah. Hazel was the next daughter, she learned the piano, became an expert on smaller instruments, trap, drum, xylophone, 
bells. It goes on. Here's a paragraph that's very interesting. Henry is on the most friendly terms with the prominent people of the Hoosier capital. He played for governors William, Porter, and Mount for the inaugurals of governors Gray and Hovey. He provided the music for the inaugural ball for Governor Durbin. It gives a list of several clubs, and here's uh, a real winner. He was the musician to furnish music on the occasion of the visits of Presidents Rutherford, Hayes, Cleveland, and Benjamin Harrison. It's a pretty good honor to have played for three kings, said Henry. <laughs> Uh, so uh, Henry was very close to the uh, the Lilly family. That's correct. Um, it, like I guess several generations of of the Lilly family. Yes, the first reference I came across was I believe 1891, where Henry and some of the daughters, several other people, are listed along with Mrs. Eli Lilly and Colonel Eli Lilly as having provided the entertainment for an evening at a, a large lake in northern Indiana. Mm -hmm. Now, it was, uh, that was 19, 1891. In 1893, Henry apparently let Colonel Eli Lilly know there was a harp uh, that could be purchased was made in England and that he certainly wished that uh, he could obtain that harp for Myrtle. And uh, Colonel Eli Lilly, I keep saying that because another very famous member of the Lilly family was also named Eli Lilly. He right. was the grandson of Colonel. The Colonel was, uh, he was a Colonel in the Civil War. He provided uh, uh, close to a thousand dollars to make it possible for Henry to purchase that harp. And of course, Myrtle used it in her concerts for many years. Um, so that was certainly evidence of the friendship that uh, the hearts had. I, I should also mention that uh, the grandson, Eli Lilly, who was also president of the, uh, the huge pharmaceutical the company, company that yeah, we've all, we all heard of now. worldwide, yeah. Um, he wrote a book called Early Days on Lake Wawasi, mm -hmm. which is another lake in northern Indiana, and he has two or three pages about the Hart Family Orchestra in there. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, it's an astonishing book for many reasons. One that's notable, notable is that on the page where you usually find a copyright, it says this book is not copyrighted. And the author would be very pleased if anybody finds an occasion to quote from the book. <laughs> so. Uh, I, so, I wanted I to ask you, Rachel, about the uh, Sarah. We never hear, she's a professional pianist, and we never hear of her performing with Andrew Yar, the girls. I know. So this is the big mystery. And, and I, I feel like she must have, right? Uh, it would make sense. And um, so it, certainly she was responsible for, for teaching the girls. Um, we're just not sure. We, Sarah is never mentioned in these newspaper articles about the Professor Henry Hart and his orchestra, right? But um, it's a curiosity. We don't know. Did Sarah always play in the band? Only sometimes when the girls were there? We just don't know. Um, I also wanted to add that didn't, um, didn't Henry learn of the harp that he wanted to, to buy for Myrtle through the um, 18... It was at 1890 Expo or 18, I don't 1893 know what. 1893. In Chicago. 1893, uh, the, so the Chicago World Fair, or the World Expo in Chicago. So she played that harp at the exhibit, and that's kind of how they fell in love with the instrument and found themselves in the conundrum of, can we afford this? How do we, how do we make this happen? So I think that's a wonderful thought, too. And so... Um, the heart, Henry and Sarah are, are both buried in Evansville. Yeah. Um, now, and um, do you know why uh, they chose to be buried there rather than the Andy? Were their their daughters back in Evansville by then, or? Well, Henry and Sarah had a daughter named Lillian, 
1870 while they were living in Evansville, and she died while she, uh, she was less than a year old. So I think they bought a cemetery plot That's what it seems like. uh, in order for her to be buried in Evansville, and that, that's probably the main reason. Uh -huh. I, I would like to, uh, is it possible to uh, focus on the front page of the current issue of the American Harp Journal? Yeah. The editor of the uh, journal decided it would be uh, a very appropriate article for a whole issue about African American harpists. This is the front page of the journal. Uh, this publication should be released just any day now. It's the winter 2021 uh, issue. Uh, this is the first page of the article. And perhaps you can see a picture of uh, Myrtle at the harp. Yeah. Th this would be the very expensive harp that uh, Colonel Lilly made possible. Yeah. And tell us a little bit, uh, Rachel, about Myrtle's career. Well, again, it's, it's as varied as her father's. Uh, she was clearly, you know, classically trained um, and had also learned how to play it, sit in in the band. But uh, mostly in her really early years, she, she did recitals, solo harp recitals. And um, uh, at some point, her dad actually went with her. So the two of them went on tour together. <laughs> I think he just went as her, you know, tour manager and coach. And, uh, but she played a lot of sort of high society recitals. Um, she actually wound up in um, a national newspaper called The Colored American. Um, both as promotion and then a review after her concert in Washington, D.C. And we'll see a picture of that um, in the next video clip that we have. It's the only photograph that I've seen yet of Myrtle. So we have the drawing that was in the earlier newspaper, and then we have a photograph of Myrtle with the harp. Um, so it's super exciting to actually see, you know, a photograph of her. But um, she went on from the solo uh, recital sort of circuit into actually playing in ensembles. And um, I think she met her second husband when he was in Chicago as a conductor. Um, so she, she went east with him towards um, the Boston area in New York. So as far as I understand, she played in a lot of live shows on Broadway. Um, she actually was part of the recording ensemble for the great Ziegfeld, which is about the the Ziegfeld Follies um, story and saga. Um, and I actually rented that movie. It was a three and a half hour movie last summer. And there was all kinds of moments. You could hear the harp kind of come out of the orchestration. And it, it was so exciting to think, oh my God, this is, this is Myrtle. And there was even an intermission, you know, when they used to take intermissions in a live movie house, um, that was full of harp solos and, you know, this beautiful harp music. So. Um, I think she wound up in the, the Boston area where, where her husband was conducting the um, Boston Colonial Theater Orchestra. And so she might have played with that orchestra too. And as I understand, she also collaborated with him on some of the arrangements for that orchestra. Mm -hmm. Well, you beautifully set up your second clip. So let's, <laughs> let's go ahead and watch yeah, so the we'll, second Yeah, we'll learn a little uh, bit more clip. about those two daughters here. Uh You know, I've got a bunch of great grandkids down here in Frankfurt, so I might tell them, look, I'll come back over the weekend and... And just come out here. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Wow. The thing I'm so hooked on is thinking about, so this is the estate as it's been for 230 years. So if this was a road or a walkway pathway, uh -huh. then we know Frederick, Judith walked this pathway. You don't have much of a leap in your imagination. Mm -mm. You can just say, yeah, this is the way they would have walked to the house if they lived in a house back there. I want a forsythia. Isn't that marvelous? I do too, I don't have one. Ooh, this looks like a good climbing tree. <laughs> so you have great grandkids. By September, I will have 20 great grandkids. Holy smokes, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. I'll, um, at the very end, there was a lot about uh, Hazel Hart Hendrix, and uh, you know, I wrote a book about jug bands in Louisville, yeah. so I was kind of excited to to hear that she started a, a jug band in uh, Indianapolis. So, mm -hmm. can you tell tell me a little bit about that now? Thank well, you. I started looking into that a little bit more deeply this this last winter, and. Um, it was officially named the Pioneer Novelty Band. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I found a couple of little newspaper articles about them, they'd refer to them as Pioneer Jug Band. So I guess, you know, it sort of meant the same thing to people. Yeah. But they were very popular. Um, I think it was, it was one of these, you know, heartwarming things to see this young group of boys and their teacher playing in a jug band. Um, and as I understand it, Hazel didn't start the group. It was already started by a music teacher at the school where she was a principal. But I think she jumped in with both feet because she just loved the idea. And of course, you know, she grew up playing this kind of, you know, playing in a family band and just picking up an instrument and going with it. So I think that she inserted herself in that ensemble and thought, well, you know, we should take this band and, and play the NAACP fundraiser, and we should go over here and play the picnic for so-and-so. So you see this in the newspaper articles that, the, the, that she really got them going and getting them out in the community and playing, um, playing concerts. And I guess in my mind's eye, she's at the piano, you know, helping them stay on the rhythm and, and, and learn the songs, and then uh, the boys. Um, are, are playing all kinds of homemade instruments or, you know, simple drums or xylophones or whatever, jugs. Um, the other interesting thing that was fairly recently um, made clear to me is that she, the, the band was really formed to give the boys that live next door, you know, an extra focal point. Maybe it was done after school or... Um, the, the, the colored orphan's home was right next door to the school. And so all, all these, these young boys lived there and, and, you know, it was probably something she did to, to help give them, a, you know, a really fun and uh, focal point for their energy and um, something to get them out in the community. And um, sadly, you know, that's what they were doing. They were on tour playing a show in um, Franklin, Indiana, just north of Indianapolis, when, when they had the car accident that killed her. So it's a, it's a very sad ending to her um, incredibly musical, dedicated life. You Do know? you know where she's buried? Was she in Evansville, too? It's a good question. I need to find that out. Maybe okay. Clark knows. Do you know do, where she's buried? Do you know buried? where Hazel is buried? Yes, she is born in, uh, born. Very, very. She was not born in Evansville. <laughs> she was born in Indianapolis, but yes, she is buried in the family plot. Okay. Have you, know. have you looked at the novelty band she had? Do you know what kind of uh, music they would have played? Like what kind of songs? Not really. Oh, okay. No, uh, I do recall though that um, she took her group to various uh, venues in the Indianapolis area mm -hmm. and in 1935 she had taken the group to I think it was Franklin, Indiana mm -hmm. and they had performed and unfortunately on the bus on the way home there was an accident mm -hmm. and she died as a result. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, at that time she was the principal of school number 37 in the Indianapolis public school system and had an excellent reputation and uh, they renamed the school for her. Yes. So it became the uh, Hazel Hart Hendricks High School or elementary school number 37. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, this family, the Hart family, starting really with, with Dolly and the beginning <laughs> of Kentucky on through to her great-granddaughters have such an incredible legacy. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do you think that um, uh, they're not more remembered? You know, why did it take you and Rachel digging this stuff up? Well, that's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> I think it would be a mistake to say that Henry was overlooked because he did minstrel music, which is not in vogue now, but it's part of our history. So mm -hmm. that was one reason. Um, I personally think that Hazel should be better remembered. Uh, the mm -hmm. school that was named the 
after her was closed in 2008 and it's being used for other purposes, um, actually Hazel wrote the school song. May I read it yeah, to you? Yeah, that's sure. right. <laughs> it starts with uh, the chorus. On a hill high up near heaven, beautiful to see, stands our glorious 37. Hail, <laughs> all hail to thee. That's the chorus. You want to hear the verses? Of course, <laughs> yes. Yeah, by the way, this was sung to the tune uh, on Wisconsin. Uh, 37, 37, to you will be true. Hail, hail, 37, we love you. Thing of beauty, joy forever, precepts high you give. And our aims to forget them never, up to them we'll live. Fleeting years may come and vanish, but where e'er will be, from our hearts will never banish tender thoughts of thee. Is that the only song we know that she wrote? As far as I know. Okay. Yeah, I don't so, think that was So, uh, Rachel, what's your opinion on why the Hart family's legacy has been forgotten until now? Well, as we're all uh, aware, um, the stories of, of women the stories of enslaved people, uh, the, the stories that were happening in the world around all of us that were not getting recorded was usually because those folks didn't have the pen and the publishing company. So Dolly's name wasn't even known officially, you know, in association with that expedition until the last 10 or 15 years. So, um, you know, she was only referred to as a Negro woman. Um, because those that were recording and writing history didn't think it was important. So that was likely the case for all these generations that, um, you know, the, the same people that loved and danced to the, the Henry Hart Orchestra uh, might not, I mean, you know, we do know that Eli Lilly wrote extensively about them, but maybe the music publishing um, industry or the recorded music industry, which really came a little bit after he was alive, you know, really didn't regard it as important. Um, you know, and, and, and they were a work for hire orchestra, and Myrtle was working for orchestras. Um, you know, it, it's an incredible story looking back at every boundary they were breaking, um, left and right. But, you know, for so many people's stories throughout the history of America, they get buried, uh, you know, in, the, in uh, they get left out of the history books. Um, it's, it's a complicated question for those that are writing the history books as to whether to even acknowledge the importance of, of African Americans in the history of music, you know, for, until very recently. Yeah. Uh, and certainly that's true for women. And, you know, um, that's what brought me to Dolly. And boy, I, I've been following her legacy ever since. So we're going to take a few questions uh, mm -hmm. from people in the chat. Um. Great, we have a question from Facebook wondering who has the $1,000 London harp now. Uh, do you know who has the harp? It's completely unknown. Uh, did you say something earlier about Henry's things? You think Hazel took his things when she... Well, it's possible that when Henry passed on in 1915, that Hazel, who just lived a few blocks away, mm -hmm. would have... Uh, taken some of his materials, it, it would be of enormous interest if any of his instruments, especially his violin, uh, have survived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Myrtle's harp, um, I mean, Myrtle, we, we didn't discuss this earlier, earlier, but when she moved to Boston, she mm -hmm. passed for white. That's right. So it might have been passed down through her yeah, family. Yeah, the McKinley that. family. She married a, a white conductor named William McKinley and she was still playing the harp into the 30s and 40s. Uh, she lived into the mid-60s. So she was quite old and had Alzheimer's, I think, there at the end. But, um, you know, likely her harp was there with her in the Boston area where she and her family lived. Um, but we just don't know yet. We'll get to still, still researching. <laughs> okay. Hopefully find out. How do you feel Henry's musical life circled back to the evolution of Kentucky music? Do you want Would you repeat the question, please? Yes. How do you feel Henry's musical life may have circled back to the evolution of Kentucky's music, Kentucky music? 
I'm going to leave that for the point. <laughs> well, I think Michael's the one to speak on potentially all the influences that he was gathering in his travels and his work up and down the river system, which is really what we were, you know, uh, getting at in, in different ways today. Is you know, he he learned and played and published all different kinds of music. So. I'm sure yeah. he's picking things up and dropping them off. You know. I would say that's the reason we're having this webinar yeah. <laughs> series to show what a mosaic Kentucky mm -hmm. music really is. And when you pick one genre, um, you, a lot of different cultures have touched it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, Henry Hart is the proof because he's gone for minstrel show the classical mm -hmm. he played all these instruments and um you know if not for you two he might be have been forgotten so who knows what other uh great musicians and composers are out there that have gotten overlooked mm -hmm. because of discrimination during their their lifetime right and and interesting to me is to think about of course what i would give to to get to hop on a river boat in 1875 and hear what the live music was like and you know if he was working on those boats or playing music and interacting with other musicians that were from up and down the river corridor then you know he's picking up ideas and styles um, so I'm sure all of those layers accumulated in his style as he as he got older and was forming this dance band I mean no telling what was in that set, but probably a whole lot of different styles, you know, of music. So I'd love to hear that <laughs> and dance to it. Uh, a two-part question. Are Henry Hart's notated compositions available to the public today? And have they been performed f uh, frequently? Or I uh, might add to that recently. Yes and no. <laughs> the, the pieces that we know about are all on the Library of Congress um, website, so you can actually go there and do a search, and they're, because they're public domain, you can access them, which is how I got them. And I made an arrangement of uh, a verse and chorus of Good Sweet Ham for a recent um, project that I was writing, and then I just recorded the Idlewild Mazurka for this uh, video that we made, uh, but I don't know. It was really hard to find recordings of his music, and uh, maybe Clark knows of other recordings, but... Um. Well, I'm not aware of recordings. I, I can recommend for anybody that would like to view his music, go to the Wikipedia article, Henry Hart, parentheses, musician. Mm -hmm. All of his known compositions are there, there. And for each one, there is a link to the sheet music. Yes, thank you. So and that's very, very convenient. That's how yeah. <laughs> if, if you are a piano player, you'll find that the, the, the works are very easy to play on piano. The form is impeccable. Mm -hmm. the, mem the, the melodies are the kind of memory, uh, you know, they, they'll get lodged in your memory. Definitely. And <laughs> you'll hear them all day, whether you want to or not. Yep. There's a great title called Daphne, Do You Love Me? And I just think that's such a great title. It's just so charming. One of, one of them is entitled Those Charming Feet. Yeah, Those Charming Feet. Which, which is another <laughs> title that suggests dancing. Yeah. Uh, I have to say that uh, uh, having worked with those melodies, arranging them to play on an instrument, that's my favorite. Those mm -hmm. Charming Feet. It's a wonderful melody. Hmm. And can we get your arrangements? online um you, uh yeah well or you can purchase it actually <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> uh, i wrote up a series of collections of melodies that were in categories the very first is african-american and jamaican so if, if you type those words and mel bay was the publisher oh, yeah. then you can purchase that um I would be thrilled if anybody would like to email me with more specific things that you'd like to see, and I'll tell you how to find them. Yeah. My address is ck6 at evansville.edu. How do you think Henry and his family's story are especially captivating now? You can guess that. <laughs> 
I, I think it's an incredibly American story and a very unique story of just one boundary-breaking moment after another. Uh, gen five generations of just defying the odds. Uh, Dolly and her son Frederick both lived into their 80s. I think Frederick was well into his 90s when he died, which is really remarkable for people born and, in the 1700s and, he and 1800s. The War of 1812. Yes, um, I can't be 100 percent sure of that yet. I'm still uh -huh. working on it, but it looks like Frederick Hart served alongside Nathaniel Hart in the War of 1812. So yes, he, uh, he's he, you know, he's a revolutionary hero. He's a the first non-native man born in Kentucky. Uh, he earned his freedom and that of his wife and his children. He got them into a free state, went to, to live in Ohio. He lived, you know, a very long life. Um, there's a wonderful, very short article where he is in his late 90s recalling his life in a sort of a uh, strange uh, article in the Cleveland paper just about notable this and that, you know. Um, man recalls his day on the frontier with Daniel Boone, you know. Um, so Frederick's and, and Judith's life is so remarkable. Henry's life is so remarkable that they that he met a pianist. They had all these girls. They taught them all how to play. They had a family band together. That's so unique. And that they're all women. You know, it's it's Maybe hard for for some folks to understand how uh, unusual it would have been to see a dance band or an entertainment band with mostly women. That that's pretty unusual, um, and it was incredibly rare for a black woman to be in any um, like classical orchestra or a recital setting. Um, and I think the fact that you know Henry was really determined. He he helped guide Myrtle in the direction of of going that way. You know, and mm -hmm. she. She really was um, headed towards the classical music field, which even today, you know, there are a, a non-representative number of African-American musicians in American orchestras. It's yeah. still something that the orchestras are trying to correct. And, um, yeah. and so this was a hundred years ago. <laughs> and she had to pass uh, to, to really she succeed had to do that. in that world, which is a whole nother story. That's a whole nother of, webinar. <laughs> oh yeah, they, that we could talk about. Yes. So it's just an incredible uh, family history. It is. Uh, I have another comment to share. Uh, a teacher at a performing arts school says they would love to have a lesson plan that includes Henry Hart and Sam Lucas. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be your cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know as much about Sam Lucas. That sounds yeah. great. All right. It would be a great way to, to make sure and to try to correct this, you know. Do we have any history. other questions? Okay, uh, what I wanted to do uh, now that we're ending um, or getting towards the end, I wanted to ask, where does your research go now? What, it, what are you going to do next with your videos, Rachel? And then mm -hmm. uh, what are you going to do, Clark? Well, um, I finished a video that was really focused on Dolly about a month and a half ago. And um, I'm calling it kind of a mini documentary. It does have some of my music and it really gets at the heart of the historic story of Dolly and the research. And so these videos that you've seen today are part, they'll be, they'll be one video eventually. Um, these are offshoots of the bigger project that I made a few years ago called The Way Forth. And that project just continues to lead me in multiple directions. So um, sometimes that's research, sometimes that's creating these film, and sometimes it's creating you know, a new piece of music or an arrangement of a piece of music. So um, I'd love to keep researching them and um, get closer to where we are now. I, I have talked to some of their descendants and, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to collaborate with them and, and really tell the story up to now. But that, that's what, where I'm working on in the research of the Hart family. So. Okay. What about you, Clark? Are you finished with the Hart family yet? Or well, is there more <laughs> stuff you want to do? I, I thought I was finished until I started looking again and mm -hmm. preparing for this event. And I, I was amazed with the number of resources that have appeared during the last 10 years. For example, if you type something relevant to Indianapolis newspapers, then you'll find a huge database 
less than a week ago, I typed Henry Hart into the search box, got more than 400 responses. Mm -hmm. This is partly because there were a number of people named Henry Hart in the right. Indianapolis <laughs> area, but most of them were our Henry. Mm -hmm. I also did that for Hazel mm -hmm. and uh, for Myrtle and got a number of uh, resources that should be further explored. And uh, in this vein, I'd, I'd like to respond to the question that was asked about mm -hmm. perhaps somebody writing up a lesson plan for a lesson that introduces the music of this remarkable family. I think that's an excellent idea. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming here. Uh, Rachel Grimes, a uh, musician you. and composer, <laughs> and, and Clark Klimmer, uh, Kimberling, uh, math professor and amateur historian, I guess. Is, and I look forward to, to uh, seeing uh, what you do in the future. And I hope everyone's enjoyed our broadcast. And as I said earlier, it's the first of three webinars that are going to be exploring the influence, the African American influence on Kentucky music. And uh, next week we'll be back with um, Layla McCullough, who uh, will be talking about how the banjo um, got written out of. Uh, or Haiti got written out of the history of the banjo. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and thank you to the Louisville uh, Folk School and uh, the Kentucky Performing Arts for putting this on for us. And I really had a great time with you really all. Fun. Thank you. I did too. <laughs>